Patrick Byrne, CEO of Overstock.com, a successful e-retailer, which was the first to accept Bitcoin. And he's selling that off soon to focus on blockchain, which we'll talk about. And he's always been in a war against Wall Street, fighting the corruption of Wall Street. You know, naked short selling, which is one of the financial setups instruments that led to the big crash of 2008. He was suppressed on Wikipedia. Byrne was later vindicated, but it just shows you that when you try to expose corruption, they will try to defame your character. I admire that about Patrick Byrne, a true contrarian thinker that's willing to fight against the popular opinion and power. In 2010, Forbes magazine named Overstock.com the number nine best company to work for in the country, and Byrne, the CEO with the highest employee approval rating. Patrick Byrne, welcome to Humans of Bitcoin. Matt, what an honor to be on. Thanks for having me. And Patrick, uh, a lot of things to, to talk about today, and I mentioned some of you know, your history in the intro. One thing that I find pretty interesting is your relationship with Warren Buffett, and I guess that started uh, with, your, with your dad. Yeah, it's one of my, I've had a lot of tailwinds in life, and what, besides drawing the parents that I drew, and one of them was when I was 13, this funny guy from Omaha who, I thought he was a farmer, but he knew something about stocks, started staying with us, and he would always make an amazing amount of time for me. He's such a wonderful guy. He would actually schedule ahead of time, hey, I'm going to be in town you know, next Tuesday and tell Patrick to be home between noon and two, and I got two hours for him. And then he would spend two hours teaching me and stuff. And I was in college when his name started getting in the paper, and it was Warren Buffett. To me, he was this sort of what you would call it, what we used to call a Dutch uncle, a guy who's your, uh, you know, like an uncle, but he's not related. And he was really, I call him rabbi after my parents. He was really my, one of my two or three greatest influences. Amazing. And there is a quote, I mean, it's, Buffett has a lot of famous quotes and like the, you know, Charlie, Charlie's Almanac and in other books and from Darwin to Munger. But one of them uh, you've referenced before, and it's, um, you know, and I know you were an athlete, but, you know, every year or two, the perfect pitch comes along um, and you have to swing from the heels. Um, but few people have the courage to do that. Uh, they usually bunt instead of going for a home run. And for those that aren't familiar with sports, especially our international crowd that doesn't watch baseball, meaning that, you know, going all in, when you see a big opportunity, not not playing it safe. Um, I, that, that, that's true, but the other aspect to that metaphor is, he th is that people think that they need to bunt at every second pitch or third pitch. And instead, his point was that you may, you have to have the temperament that lets you stand there for a year or two until, and you know, people are throwing you pitches every day, but a pitch may be a little high and inside, you let it slide. You, another pitch is a little you know, low, you let it slide. But every couple years, there's gonna be a really fat pitch, and then that's the one that you go all in on for. So the, it's a combination of two things, the character to be willing, and especially, because in the stands, as, as the way Buffett tells the story, there's some people you don't know, strangers, <coughs> standing there saying, swing you bum, swing you bum, and you've got to <coughs> be able to ignore them until that perfect pitch comes. But when it does, you come out of your shoes on it. You swing for the fences. Too many people go through and they bunt at every, at every fourth pitch. So it's about being very selective. And maybe you only have sort of 10 to 20 big decisions in life. And that, that's how you should think about life. Okay, I like that. So it's a combination of the plate discipline, um, you know, the power of saying no to most things. But when it comes around, you have to take advantage of that. Exactly. Um, and, and and one question, I mean, just really brilliant people uh, who have influenced me a lot uh, from afar, um, is his, his partner is, is less well known, but I would say equally brilliant, Charlie Munger. Have you had dealings with him as well? I have had um, with Charlie. I've known, I probably met him when I was about 16. We run into each other all, well, every two or three years we used to run into each other and have a conversation. Buffett calls him my public or my... Uh, my personal philosopher or something like that, Charlie, he calls Charlie Munger. And Munger added a great deal, uh, Buffett would say, to his thinking and his understanding of the world and such. Yeah, I've had a lot of interaction with, I mean, I've had a number of interactions with Munger periodically over the years. Wonderful fellow, very, very different than, Budgen, quite, than Buffett, quite curmudgeonly. And he prides himself on his curmudgeonliness. And uh, he's a real cynic where Buffett is, you know, Buffett's just a lot of fun to be with and happy and up and exuded. And Munger is just this dour, you know, cynic about everything. So it's really quite a, quite a Bartles and James kind of team. 
Yeah, and they've, they've done quite well, uh, understatement there. I, uh, I recommend anyone listening to read From Darwin to Munger, and, and Charlie goes into, it's a book about Charlie Munger, and he's authorized it, and he goes into the mental models, right? Ways of thinking, and what we just talked about with you know, waiting for the, the, the pitch and going all in, you know, fits in with some of the mental models he has, and also just how to, to learn and, and study things. And um, you know, moving on, I mean, the, the, your career, I, I wanna talk a little bit about being, you know, at certain times, and maybe today, I don't know, the, the most hated man on Wall Street. I mean, you've been at war with Wall Street for a long time, and maybe the peak uh, hate, to, to phrase it that way, was in, in 2007. I mean, you know, how are you feeling? Is it, is it tiring? Is it invigorating? A, a combination? Oh, it's nothing now. It was, it was a little tough in the last decade. Yeah, it was uh, 04, 05, 06, 07. I waged what was basically a one-man Occupy Wall Street. And I did that. I grew up in the Holy Church, a capital market. So besides my dad, who was an insurance executive, Buffett was sort of my Dutch uncle. I went off to college, ended up with a PhD from Stanford. Guys like Partha Descupta and Ken Arrow and Milton Friedman, these great economists, were my personal friends and in some cases teachers. Uh, and so I grew up in the holy church of capital markets. I work, Buffett had me work on Wall Street when I was about 30. I went for, he said, I want you to go to Wall Street for one year. Don't work longer than a year, but you gotta learn how the game's played. So I went to work for a friend of his for a year. Uh, and so, sorry, uh, Patrick, and you were one year on Wall Street. What exactly did you do and what, what company was it? I was an equity analyst with First Manhattan, Sandy Gottesman and Arthur Zankel, two wonderful men. Arthur's no longer with us, but Sandy's still alive and active and still running First Manhattan. So, uh, so I had, and he's a real gentleman, and I grew up with a certain understanding of the way the game is played. You know, you get a certain speech when you're in the financial world. There's like the talk you get when you're a young man. And everyone, I, you get a talk at some point, some older guy pulls you aside and says something like this. Look, Patrick or Matt, you're going to be, if you're in this industry, you're going to be around other people's money your whole life. You've got to decide now where your line is, and I hope your line is well inside the law. These are the kind of way, this is just how I was brought up in finance. In 02, Overstock went public. And I mean, it wasn't like I was a virgin. I knew that there was some, some shady business on Wall Street. But as a public company CEO, you're out there in the mix and you're out there dealing with hedge funds and prime brokers and analysts and sometimes regulators and such. And it did not take me very long to smell skunk. And by 04, I had pretty much mapped it out. I knew what was going on in the market. I knew how certain people were doing certain things. I thought that life was, am I giving you a $10 answer to a nickel question? Do you want, do you want me to, I don't really No, want no, to this is answer. interesting. Keep going, keep going. I thought life was like the Pelican Brief, that when Julia Roberts figures out the scheme and she writes it up and makes it public, the whole world, all the good guys sweep in to help you. Well, I was not, I didn't understand how captured the institutions were at that, when I did this. And I found out that the Senate Banking Committee and the House Financial Services and the, the, all the different institutions you would go to when you thought you had figured out, I'd figured out that a number of things, that there was a, in the settlement, there was a crack at the base of Wall Street. Some bad guys had figured out how to make money out of it. It was destabilizing the system. And that Washington, while we thought that Washington was here to protect us from Wall Street, that Washington had actually become kind of bought off by Wall Street. This is what I came out and said in 04, and in a pretty famous talk. And the next day I was in the newspapers, like the New York Post with UFOs coming out of my head to suggest that Wall Street and New York were, I mean, Wall Street and, and Washington DC had become inappropriately close. That was crazy conspiracy theory in 04, 05. Well, after, and I kept fighting this fight, I knew the world was gonna melt down. I didn't understand how people didn't see that you could not have a settlement system with the kind of slop permitted in it that we had at the time. And then after 08, when everything crashed and Alan Greenspan went before Congress and he named exactly the thing that I'd been warning about for four years as really, it's been kind of, kind of whitewashed out of history. But at the core of what happened in 08 was a settlement crisis. And Alan Greenspan 
went before Congress and told them that. It's been kind of forgotten. But at the core of it all, this settlement system froze up like a database could, could freeze. And that's exactly what I had been pouring kerosene on myself and setting myself on fire about, trying to warn the world that the settlement system had to slop and it was gonna, it was gonna crater. So, so I was really hated up until 08. My sense of things is after 08, there were a number of articles about how I was vindicated and then kind of everybody wanted to kind of, kind of to forget it, both me and them. And it was okay by me. It's kind of hard being this guy. I'm so pro market and capital markets. To me, it's a sacred institution. A capital market is a place where millions of promises are woven together. I mean, it's like the core heart and lungs of civilization. And it just, maybe I, I was a bit like Mar Martin Luther standing, pounding my 95 theses on the door. You know, I was so upset about what I found once I became a public company CEO. But we're past that. People seemed I was named financial CEO of the year or something, or Walsh, uh, a year or two ago by one of those magazines. Uh, uh, only the old timers seem to still bear a grudge. And I, I'm trying to be friendly to Wall Street. I'm trying to put all that behind me and try to be friendly. I've shown up with cold fusion, and I know it's extremely disruptive to Wall Street, and there's a lot of people afraid, and I'm trying not for them to be afraid. I'm trying, I feel like I want to give this, I'm trying to find the right partners on Wall Street to give this to. I think that we've got cold fusion that's going to improve the lot of humanity, and, I, and I'm, not, I'm not about vindictiveness anymore. Although there is an old saying, you know, the old joke about what's Irish Alzheimer's, that's when you forget everything but your grudges. <laughs> so, oh, it's very interesting. So, now, um, I, I admire that. I admire the, the courage you have. And, I mean, but, and yeah, it's, it's, in the, it's in the background. We have to move forward. But, I mean, one, when you talk about, um, you know, documenting history, for better or worse, Wikipedia is, is considered, you know, it, it documents history, right? It's, it's the world's encyclopedia. And Sorry. I believe, uh, from, some, from some of my colleagues, last year, you... Um, because listen, when you when you speak out the truth that that's inconvenient for people, I think there's that um, that saying that it's hard to convince someone of something when their salary depends on not understanding it. And uh, I mean, you uh, but people at Bitcoin.com are proud the way you called out Jimmy Wales for being complicit in and allowing the whole uh, naked short selling thing, you know, exposing a part of the the 2008 financial crisis um, on, on Wikipedia. Well, that's funny. I hadn't thought about that since that happened at the conference. But it's a funny story. And here's something people can, this is the only conspiracy theory in the world you can check from your desk. Go Google my name and the register.com and you will find a series of articles from 06, 07 where they documented this. They're, what I'm about to tell you. And this is, the register is a British online thing. It's like fast company, only it's online. And it, it covers Silicon Valley. Uh, and they documented this in a series of stories you can find there, that there are something like 8 million English language articles on Wikipedia. And there's one constitution that governs 8 million articles. There's a separate constitution that governs two and only two articles. The article on Patrick Byrne and the article on the issue that I was raising hell about. It's very strange. And Jimbo Wales, who comes from the Chicago uh, options exchange or something. He comes from sort of the sleaziest part of the capital markets in America. He personally arranged it within Wikipedia. It was the subject of the greatest Wikipedia civil war there ever was. If you want to read about it, there's about five articles. Look up my name, Patrick Byrne, and theregister.com. You'll find some shocking articles. They documented there's a special con reality works one way for Wikipedia for eight million articles, and there's a special constitution that governs it for the article on me and the article on the issue on Wall Street that I raised hell about. How odd. And that was Jimbo Wales is doing. Jimbo Wales and a woman from my background, frankly, named, it turned out that there was a woman a very high up in the uh, hierarchy of Wikipedia, goes by the name of Slim Virgin. Her real name is Linda Mack, and she was a fellow student of mine 25, 30 years ago in Cambridge. She evidently bears a grudge against me. Anyway. Wow. I'm going into, yeah, it's a pretty crazy story, but it's been all documented out there. And listeners, everything that Patrick talks about today, uh, we'll link to on podcast.bitcoin.com uh, under the Humans of Bitcoin podcast. Um, so, I mean, this, I think this is a good backdrop, you know, 2007, 2008, and a lot of this, um, 
you know, complicit Goldman Sachs, uh, Wall Street, uh, just, you know, CD and company, all these things that were going on, you know, spurred, spurred Bitcoin. And so I guess my next question for you is, how did you find Bitcoin? Well, it's kind of funny. Years ago, when I got out of college, I had cancer three times. And so I spent my 20s pretty much as an invalid or, and, or convalescing. So what do you do? You do a graduate degree when you're me. And I started, and before I knew it, I had sort of gotten, had done a PhD uh, in philosophy. At, but along the way, I studied the mathematics that underlies cryptography. It's called computation theory. And it's a really area, interesting area of mathematics, which at Stanford is, it's an area that grew out of philosophy. Guys like Tarski, guys like, uh, who's the guy who, uh, Alan Turing. Uh, so it was an area of philosophy that I was studying that got me the, called computation theory, but it's very mathematical and it includes things like the Byzantine generals problem. That all comes out of computation theory. Well, and that's the mathematics that underlies cryptography. So 25 years later, 20 odd years later, I was reading, I think, Wired magazine and I came across this blurb about some new invention and it had something about the Byzantine generals problem in it. I thought, that's odd. It was like my favorite thing I ever studied was this area in my life. That my favorite thing I ever studied was this area of math. So that was, that's how I tuned in. It was just some little article that mentioned how somebody had used uh, cryptography to, form, to create a form of money. And it was the mention in specific of the Byzantine generals problem that got me to tune in on it and realize, hey. Right, with it. Second. And for those that aren't familiar, that you know, that's the consensus, the proof of work mining that that Bitcoin still uses uses today. Um, amazing. I, and, and Patrick, it's very interesting to me whether people studied the financial system, how the Federal Reserve works. Another thing that we don't learn in schools. But uh, the reason I bring this up, other people that have gotten into Bitcoin early, it's because they had this this free mind that was was studying other subjects, and they had enough context because Bitcoin's a very esoteric concept that they were able to that led them to at least explore a little bit, a little bit more. Right. Um, very philosophical. This crowd is very, they're not just, you can always tell the tourists because those are the ones who are showing up saying, what's Bitcoin going to do this year? Is it going to go up? Those are the tourists. The people who are really in the movement understand this is, this is a real political philosophy. This is very well, this is very entwined with certain political and philosophical sentiments about liberty and freedom. That's right. And so uh, you've, you, we'll, we'll say like you're, we're at a, a calm, a, you know, a, a truce right now with Wall Street and you're working together and you launched T0, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, what do you expect? Um, and this, this is just going to happen because Bitcoin is a threat to the, the legacy financial system. Um, what do you expect? Um, I mean, it's happening already, but uh, going forward, what do you see the press blocking out about Bitcoin and blockchain going forward that we have to, you know, get the truth out about? Well... They clearly tried to stigmatize it for years, which is why I spent a whole bunch of years saying, you know, and you know, it isn't, it isn't just that everybody who's involved in this movement is into ecstasy dealing or gun running or whatever people were doing on Silk Road, uh, that there's a lot more to this technology than that. Uh, I think that it's kind of funny in the establishment, we're over the hump. In the established, so I deal with regulators and, and people in law enforcement and government, and you know they have a legitimate interest in, it seems to me, in understanding and and you know if the world as we know it is going to be disrupted, there's a legitimate point for government to be saying, you know, to be look to be curious about it and to have a say in it. Uh, I find that, to be honest, the there's a lot of people across government who are welcoming this. There's all kinds of people, and I've been pleasantly so. As a guy who's probably been the greatest critic of the SEC in decades, I hope it counts for something when I say it's a different organization than it was 10 years ago. It really is. I dealt with them 10 years ago, and I deal with them now. It's a different organization. It's filled with people who actually want to regulate. The idea of having a healthy capital market is music to their ears. They, so, for example, when I've dealt with them in FINRA, and we got to the point of explaining how a, a Bitcoin or a blockchain-based capital market could work and eliminate all kinds of systemic risk, and you would never have problems of, of, a, of, of critical path junctures failing. The people who are in the regulatory bodies that, whose job is preventing systemic risk, 
you see their eyes get big and they start asking questions and it starts clicking for them. The people who are in the job of enforcing, enforcing the regulations, you know, I remember the meeting, and I won't say what agency or group it was with, but it was somebody in law enforcement. I explained to them, you know, they, that the current Wall Street as it exists, the public, you know, the public has trouble believing this, but did you know that when the government sees an illegal trade, you would think they could just say, ha, who's behind that trade and trace it back to them and go after them? Well, they do something called blue sheeting. They issue a blue sheet where they Sorry, say- Sorry, Patrick, I just want to make sure the audience is clear. A legal trade, maybe like an insider trade, like I sold mm -hmm. Apple stock having information that was not public. Right. right. That's, okay. That would be an example. Well, they blue sheet it, which means they go to the brokers and the exchanges and they say, we want to track who was behind this trade. Turns out they can't do it. And Congress found out in 2008 that they, they can't do it. And it's because of this settlement system that I've been talking about for years. It gets very technical, but it's like the records disappear into a mist. And why that happens is too complicated to explain in a podcast. But believe it or not, they cannot trace many or most illegal activity back to the individuals. So Congress, after 08, Congress in 2010 mandated that they come up with some way to do that. It's called a consolidated audit trail. And, that from, and from then on, that they would always be able to trace every trade back to the origin. Well, they've worked on it for nearly a decade. I think over a billion has been spent on it, and they have basically have broken their pick. They've gotten nowhere. I explained to the regulators, look, in a blockchain-based capital market, you will have visibility into the atomic level of the market. Every trade is completely, nothing is netted. There are no mists that things disappear into. And you will have absolute regulatory clarity into, so when you're in the room, you know, there's some regulators sitting there like this with their arms folded, not liking you at all. But you start, real, you start noticing some of them, the penny drops, and they start realizing, gee, their life's going to get a lot easier in a blockchain or a crypto-based capital market. The regulators are going to have, it's going to be a much cleaner market. For sure. And I guess that's referring to, to the stock market. But I will also say, uh, I'm not sure if you saw this, you know, middlemen or you know people that are serving a, a need to the market now that stand to lose like visa and american express i can send you an article on this patrick in case you didn't see it but american express was promoting they were paying for advertising on twitter to misinform people about the the effects of of mining bitcoin on on global warming essentially exaggerating the effects so there are you know there are certain entities that that will try to create this uh this fear on uncertainty and doubt oh um, yeah but they, it's really good to eat they're yeah. stigmatizing everywhere that for years, anytime I tried to talk about what blockchain could do for the world, journalists would say, but isn't it about ecstasy dealing? I mean, that's all they were just stuck on that, yeah. you know, and, but it seems an agenda, there is an agenda from the establishment to stigmatize it. But I really think we're over that hump. That's that's exciting to hear. Now, um, Patrick, as I mentioned, I'm here in Mexico right now, heading to Anarchapulco tomorrow. And currently I'm about three hours away from Tulum, where uh, I guess the, you know, in Overstock, uh, the uh, Medici, that is kind of, that's kind of the overall umbrella for all your blockchain initiatives going forward. They just struck a, uh, a, a deal in Tulum for, for land rights. So I first want to explain to the audience, you know, why land rights and, and blockchain are so important. I mean, I, I know that in the, the awful uh, earthquakes in Haiti, Literally, the you know the government building got destroyed. That had the records of all this all this property ownership. Um, so I'm, and and you know not too far away geographically, Haiti to you know to the east coast of of, of Mexico in Tulum. You know what uh, what uh, is going on there? I am so excited about this. I am so excited. There's a theory that the World Bank has actually been putting forward since the 1970s, but I think it's it's right that all development really starts when you get land titling. When you first have rule of law, the first thing that happens is the government is saying, okay, this is your, you know, this is yours and that's mine. And it's, uh, that's the first thing that rule of law does. And so the theory has been that the way to help the developing world develop is not, you don't, we don't have to give them money. And that seems to have a lot of pernicious effects as well. It's been quite unsuccessful, really. Western development aid since World War II has been largely unsuccessful, arguably counterproductive. The countries which have taken the most are the countries which have made the least progress, and the countries which 
back themselves out of the whole aid mafia or they're actually the ones that have done best. So what's that tell us? Uh, I, so the argument is that if we can get land titling done and, and pe peasants or campesinos or whatever they be called in whatever country, you know, two thirds of the world, five billion out of seven and a half billion people don't live in the world that you and I inhabit. They don't have a piece of paper that says, I own this house, I can take to a bank, I can borrow five grand and go start a, a hot dog stand. They don't have that. They live in informal favelas or barrios or shanty towns, they're called. That's how five billion people live. And they may, anyway, we have a way through the intersection of blockchain uh, and mobile apps, which we are very, very good at, and working with governments, uh, we, we are now making deals with governments. So in Tulum, Mexico, the indigenous people are going to get all titled up so developers can't take their land from them. We have in, in Rwanda, well, we have in Zambia, we just completed in November the, an experimental program where we title up 50,000 homes in a, we don't have a nice word for this. Oh, the word, the politically correct term is peri-urban. Peri-urban is what, you would call a, a favela or a barrio or a, sh a slum or a whatever, but the peri-urban area around the capital and uh, 50,000 homes and we got that done and now they're giving us the whole country. We're, built, we're gonna, over the next three years, we'll have the entire country of Zambia titled up and we're working, it's all the government is promoting it and billboards and radio campaigns, but it's our workers on the ground, hundreds of them in green shirts going around and finding people in their homes and saying, if you want the government to recognize this land, we now, I've got an iPad here, I can take photos of whatever documents you have, I can formalize your informal ownership. Well, we just did that for 50,000 people in a month, 50,000 households in a month in Zambia. It was supposed to take a year. We did it in a month, we can do the whole country in two or three years. Rwanda has 11 million homes, they have uh, engaged with us, and we've announced the MOU, we are, in fact, I just was speaking to the guy on the phone who, they already have the 11 million titles done. We are building the online system that lets everybody interact, pay their taxes, transfer ownership, will it, inheritance, all that stuff, all online, all paperless. And by eliminating meetings, frankly, you're also eliminating a bunch of corruption. You know, the great, to me, and I figured this out, I'm just a stupid guy, but I figured out a few easy, big things early. And one is development's all about corruption. It's all about women and ending corruption. When you have a corrupt rule of law, everybody's just building on quicksand and nobody gets anywhere. I spent a bunch of time in Asia and figured that out myself. Uh, by blockchain, by introducing blockchain into these processes, it's going to, there's all kinds of, there's a whole class of humanity that are rent, what economists call rent extractors. They're just in these positions and every time if you're in India, for example, I don't want to pick on one country, and you run a factory and you want to buy, you want to hire, you're expanding, you want to use more electricity, you go to some petty bureaucrat and you apply to hire 20 more people and to use more electricity and you fill out forms and of course you pay them off something. So at every little juncture of economic activity in India, there, there's this more, what Mexicans call la modita, the, the little bite. Um, that can all is going to get frozen out as this as these things move into blockchain. All that gets frozen out. Shh, don't tell. I, I actually don't want the crooks to know because I don't think they're going to understand how badly they're going to get stumped by blockchain. Blockchain is going to end corruption around the globe over time as more and more of governmental process move into it. It's going to become harder and harder to be to get your more data. And uh, yeah, or like in, in Colombia, they'll call it la gota gota. I mean, uh, but can you expand? You said, do you say that development is about women? It, did, I, did I get that right? Yeah, it's, I mean, I'm summarizing a Stanford graduate education and development theory. It all came down to, I decided there was a bunch of, a lot more math than there needed to be. That it came down to some very simple things. There was an experiment, uh, Amartya Sen, I think was the guy, him or Partha Desgupta, I heard a lecture on this. There was an experiment where they take a village in India and you take the, out, the output variable to be the, the weight of children, which is a very, very good way to measure the well-being of a household. 
increases in the weight of children. You go to one village and you give money to men and you look for an increase in, in weight of children and you get nothing. You get an increase, as this economist put it, in consumption of three things, alcohol, tobacco, and hookers. Uh, you go to an identical village, yeah, and I said that to Buffett once, and he said, yeah, yeah, and the rest of it they waste. <laughs> but that was, it's an old W.C. Fields joke, I should make clear. He was, there was a W.C. Fields or something like I spent half my income on whiskey and cigars, the other half I waste. Anyway, so you go to an identical village, and you give money to women, and you immediately see this increase in the weight of children. And the same experiment's been done across Central Asia, Africa, South America. Turns out females bank their future in their children. They bank calories in their children. If they have an excess amount of income today, they use it to feed their children. In a sense, they're banking through banking calories in their children. Men, alcohol, tobacco, and hookers. It's a, and it's been documented all over the world. So if you want to develop, really, I, I used to think it was about learning things like the Herod Domar model and all kinds of not economics, it's really about focusing on women and focusing on rule of law. You do those two things, development takes care of itself. Wow, I'd like to add a couple comments to that. You mentioned about the, the informal economy and, and five billion people. Uh, it's also, so myself and Ignacio Cupello, who's a, he's Venezuelan, he lives in the US, and he actually was at the Cato Institute for a little bit. Him and I are heading up our efforts in, in for, it's called Venezuela.Bitcoin.com. We're doing on-the-ground efforts to teach people about cryptocurrencies. And uh, you mentioned that the kind of the fail, like the favela-style lifestyle, but we've come across a lot of people as well where land rights are important. They're they're professionals, right? They have degrees, um, and they had office, you know, they owned office in certain office buildings in Venezuela and homes, and they were also confiscated by the government. So I just wanted to make the point that it's, um, you know, in certain you know corrupt governments, they can t what you don't just have to be someone maybe. Uh, more of a, uh, you know, an agriculture or in a rural part. You can be, you know, a high standing member of society and have your property uh, seized. So it's, it's, uh, it's pretty encouraging to me the, how, you know, this whole random rights thing that you're working on, the, the effects it can have for so many different, uh, you know, so many different people around the world. Um, I'm excited. I'm nice. actually, as, as is publicly known, I'm, we may very well be selling the retail business. And that's right. really because uh, I think I can, in five years, I, as grandiose as this sounds, change things for billions of people. Brock Pierce says the new definition of a billionaire is a guy who changes a billion lives. I think that we can. We have the jump on using that. We have built out in the last two years amazing systems, and there's whole countries calling us and saying, Br "Bring over." You know, we want your land rights. We want your Wall Street. We want your blockchain central bank. We want it. What we want. Can, the can you name any of those uh, countries? I can't name individuals. I can tell you the continent of Africa. We've had that conversation okay. with All right. large countries there. And yeah. in fact, I can tell you. Okay, I'll name a country. I think I can say this. He would be. Uh, plea, he wouldn't object. David Burt, Prime Minister of Bermuda, wonderful fellow. Gosh, I just spent seven hours locked in a great conversation with him in Mexico, in Cancun. He, uh, he's ready to have Bermuda be that. And, and I think that it makes some sense because if we're building this technology, say blockchain central bank, before I have a country of 100 million people relying on it, I'd love to have a country of 60,000 people using it, and that's Bermuda. So we've talked about using Bermuda as the prototype lab for all these products, which are just entering their, their release, frankly. And I, I, that's appealing to me to actually maybe even move to Bermuda and spend six months getting all this implemented there and working six months to a year before I really expanded in Africa. But Africa is very big. But I have to say there's other, uh, S South America, there's huge potential, and especially, in the movement to protect the rights of indigenous people and, and people, I mean, when you're, tech, when you're bringing informal people into the formal sector, what you're bringing is rule of law to, to people who are excluded from it. So, I mean, I, th I, I think it could be as crazy as it sounds, it's almost biblical what I think this is gonna do. I think that for 6,000 years, humans and civilization have done things one way. Blockchain's gonna let us do it a different way. And I think that a thousand years from now, they'll be talking, this revolution is gonna be bigger than the Gutenberg press, gonna be bigger than the internet. It's changing the way humans 
interact because instead of creating third party institutions which are corruptible, we are reducing things to mathematics and cryptographically protected algorithms. Amazing. And yeah, so I, I think that uh, it's pretty obvious that we talked about this in the beginning, blockchain and, and Bitcoin, this was the swing, swing for the fences and you know, get selling off overstock, uh, which has been you know, one of the first, maybe the first large retailer to accept uh, Bitcoin, uh, you know, shows that, right? You're really, really digging in here on, um, on this. And, and so you mentioned you know, favorable regulations with, with uh, maybe the SEC, we'll call it Wall Street in general, that's a, a broad term there. Um, you know, recently, uh, you know, Overstock mentioned they'll start paying taxes in Ohio. And as you know, with Caitlin, uh, Wyoming's passing a lot of pro, you know, blockchain and cryptocurrency friendly laws. And there's this whole kind of state versus federal battle. You see this in the marijuana industry. Um, you know, what's your, what's your take so far on this progress? Where do you see it going? Well, first of all, I think Caitlin is the best mind in crypto. And just so you should know, if you, anytime you can have her on, she's the smartest person in crypto. And what she's doing in Wyoming yeah. is, is off the hook. I thought it would have happened in New Hampshire, or frankly, Rhode Island was making noises. Did Rhode Island ever pass anything dramatic? Because a year ago, they weren't- I don't think so, but I, I could be wrong. You could have, you would have heard, a year ago, I, they were in touch with me and they were, on the verge, they said, of passing this dramatic stuff. And anyway, Caitlin, Caitlin, what she did with Wyoming has made Wyoming the best place in the United States to do crypto. I, uh, I think Utah, I'm hearing from legislators in Utah that they want to copy Wyoming. It's all going to break. It's all going to break. Um, so what else? So that's Caitlin. Those were my thoughts on Caitlin. What else did you ask about? I'm sorry. Uh, how, yeah, well, where's this state federal thing? <clears throat> State federal thing. Yeah, well, because the, 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 Sorry, there are, it's pretty well laid out what the states can regulate and what the feds do. Of course, no one anticipated crypto, but it's possible. So, for example, Wyoming legalized. There's going to be a blockchain bank there. There's going to be. It's uh, there's a lot you can do with just the cooperation from the states without cooperation from the feds. But I want to emphasize that it is not at all the case that the feds are homogeneously against crypto. There's people across, people in agencies and groups across the federal government who realize this is gonna, well, A, there's no, you, you can no more out stop this than you could stop the seasons from changing at this point. And B, they understand it's gonna do a lot of good. They're trying to adapt to it. But I think that you may be overstating the amount of, of resistance at this point. I'm, I'm, I'm really, it seems like we've got over the hump in the last year, and it's no longer about, is, are we gonna let this go forward or not? It's about working, the government wants to be involved in the design of these institutions so they understand their interests are, and they have legitimate interests. I don't want terrorists to be able to you know, do bad things. And, uh, but I think that the government is really quite accepting of this, and they're not gonna stop it. Okay, well, that's good to hear because, and you mentioned this as well, I mean, the US to, to be at the forefront of the, you know, the, the internet of money um, and, and, you know, trustless, you know, distributed databases with the blockchain, um, they're going to need this. They're, they're going to need to be involved with this. So there is a, is a motive there. Um, and yeah, and, and maybe, maybe we, again, when you mentioned the federal government, that's very broad. There's different agencies that have, you know, different uh, goals and, and, and motives. Um, I guess from my side, I see a lot on, I focus a lot on the, the cryptocurrency side. But uh, you're, you cannot deny the progress that has been made and like, you know, Jay Clayton and other people that have spoke very fav uh, favorably of Bitcoin. Um, has he? Has Clayton spoken? Tell me what he has said. This is the chairman of the SEC. He, what has he said? Yeah, he, um, he became a hero. He, he talked about the need to understand cryptocurrencies that, you know, that they're not going away. I, I think in response, I can send you the articles. I can't remember. I don't have as good a memory of you, uh, Patrick, but I can send them. But he's, he, uh, Clayton became a, uh, a, a hero on Twitter at the cryptocurrency community. And you know how, uh, uh, you know how vindictive the cryptocurrency and Bitcoin community is on Twitter. So he, he managed to become a, a hero, at least for, for a couple of days there uh, last year. Um, and and so, so Patrick, I mean, uh, one reason I personally admire you and a lot of people in Bitcoin is, you know, you're a contrarian thinker. I don't think there's any dispute there. Um, you know, what do most people today disagree with you about? Interesting. Well, what do they disagree with me about? Uh, hmm, that's a great question. No one's ever asked me that. 
Uh, I think that my general, here's probably the biggest contrarian piece of my philosophy. I think that the fractionally reserved, Keynesian multiplied, magic money tree financial system we live in is seeing its last days. I think it's all going to crash and they're just keeping it. I think that what we are really in the act of doing, we have the crypto world, you and I, are building what's going to be a, a warm standby for, for civilization itself. So when the, the, when the systems we're on fail, the central banking and the, and the, and the debt-based money and Keynesianism, when they all fail, we, civilization won't be over. We will have this warm standby. We'll do a hot swap using geek language. We'll do a hot swap to these other systems. We'll have a functioning capital market. We'll have a functioning central bank. We'll have blockchain central bank. We'll have functioning voting systems. In fact, I mean, all this stuff will be built. I feel like I'm in a race against time. I've got like, I don't know, what do we have? How a couple years before the system as we know it starts buckling? Uh, that feels about right. Well, if we can have two years before the system, before we have another 08, we can, with two years, we can build functioning standby systems that will be in a position to hot swap with the, uh, the DTCC and other places when they crash. Amazing. Um, and, the, uh, and you mentioned you're on good terms with the DTCC. For those that aren't familiar with it, what is the DTCC exactly? It's this, uh, the Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation. It's the central clearinghouse of Wall Street. You know, up until the early 70s, Wall Street functioned with guys running around with burlap sacks of stock certificates and that among brokers, and that's how they settled trades. In, in the 1960s, volume on Wall Street quadrupled, and the guys with the sacks couldn't keep up. And actually, Wall Street log jammed. And people forget, it was called the Great Wall Street Paperwork Crisis. Some brokerages went out. And so Wall Street created a one central clearinghouse, a central counterparty clearing. If you wanted to learn more, look up the phrase central counterparty clearing. And anyway, that's an organization called the DTCC. It's the, it's the hub of Wall Street. But it's also, it's run by a very good guy now, Michael Boskin. And I've gotten to know, they used to be my enemy. We've, I, we've made peace. Um, it's just a, it's a design, a, an institutional design that came about in the 70s, and the truth is blockchain disrupts it. Blockchain is going to basically, ultimately, you don't need the central counterparty clearing. We can go back to having individual direct and, and uh, perfectly honest clearing. Amazing. Yeah, and, and so not having to rely on third parties to hold your, your stock certificates. And I'll link your speech. I think you gave it at the Cato Institute and some other ones where you talk about how you don't actually own, you know, if you buy Apple stock, you don't actually own yeah. that stock yourself. Someone else has a certificate for you. All um, the stock no. in the, all the stock, and this is an interesting point that, get, that gets the light bulb on in people. All the stock in America is owned by a corporation no one's ever heard of called CD and Company. And not just warehoused, not just guarded, literally the ownership is in this company. And then that company has issued what are basically chits, chits or IOUs into the DTCCC that propagate out into the system of brokers and, and this and that. And all you really own, when you, and if you, from, when you get your mortgage statement and it says you have 100 shares of IBM, if you actually read all the terms upside down, backwards in Greek, and on page eight of your brokerage agreement, what you understand, what you will understand is you actually just have an IOU from a company, which has an IOU from another company, which has an IOU from another company, which has an IOU from a company in New Jersey, called Cedian Corporation that actually owns, legally owns, corporate America. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, Patrick, a question for you here. Uh, I just have a hunch. Um, so my question is, uh, do you have a relationship with Peter Thiel? And if so, what type of subjects do you, do you talk about? You know, I don't. I think we communicated by email once and he asked me out to see him. I don't think we've ever, uh, I, I don't think I've ever, I may have spoken to him on the phone once. You would think, you know, he studied philosophy at Stanford, so did I. I think we may have overlapped a little bit. He was undergrad, I was grad. And uh, we're libertarians and he seems like a wonderful fellow. So I should probably get in touch with him at some point. Yeah, and uh, half half joking here. If you do get in touch, tell them to tell them to come on the podcast. But okay. uh, 
But, uh, but and, and Patrick, uh, you mentioned, okay, you mentioned Warren Buffett, uh, Caitlin Long, who was on the podcast, and she's going to come on again, I think, in a couple weeks to talk about the progress w- of Wyoming. Um, you know, who else do you, do you look up to? In this field, I really look up to Bruce Fenton. You probably want him on. He's back in Bruce Fenton. He's a uh, uh, Bruce Fenton Ravencoin. He's sort of the big mind behind Ravencoin, if you're familiar with that. But he's a is big that for th- security tokens? Yeah, and okay. he's a big thinker in this field. Caitlin knows him, uh, and of course Voorhees, Roger Vore, uh, Roger Ver. You ever talk with him? Does he do interviews? I don't know. He's a yeah. Well, he co- owns he owns Bitcoin.com. You know he that? owns this? So I, I, he's my boss. Yeah, he's, he's paying me to have a conversation with you. How cool is that? Swear to God, I did not know that. Swear to God, I did not know that. I, I did not know that. I was just looking for the most interesting names in the field. Well, Roger, he's, he's one of those faces I always look forward to crossing paths with, as we do all over the world. He's a terrific fellow and passionate and philosophically sound about what this is all about. I didn't know. I had no idea he owned this. I had no idea Roger owned this. I love him. I love him. Oh, yeah. And yeah, Roger's Roger. invested in, like, every project in, in Bitcoin and blockchain. Um, um, okay, two final questions here. So, Medici, that's the name of... Okay, so I was looking up Medici, and, um, I mean, well, Cardano is also famous, but there's a lot of great, you know, the Italian Renaissance, uh, Da Vinci, obviously, you can't... You know, why did you choose to call it uh, Medici Ventures? And I believe they were kind of like a... They were Italian... Uh, you know, royal family, right, that uh, helped foster the Renaissance. Yes, they were an Italian banking family that, in, that actually were uh, traded with the Middle East, and uh, they were from Florence, and they, or Venice, I forget which, but it, by trading with the Middle East, they came in contact with double-entry bookkeeping. They introduced double-entry bookkeeping to the West, and that gave, and they started a bank. And that, their bank, the Bank de Medici, became the great, uh, uh, first great bank of Europe. And it was based because they had gotten double entry bookkeeping. So they, they had under, came to understood uh, a, a proper ledger system. So we named, since we think we're going to revolutionize the world again through this new ledger system, a digital ledger, we named it after them, the Medici. They also created a couple of popes. Amazing. Their, yeah, they, their, their family generated a couple of popes, I think. Amazing. And uh, well, Patrick, I guess one last question for you. I mean, you, you've talked about the importance of living, you know, living in the present. You never know when, when our last day will come and having kind of a, a 90 day plan. Um, you know, is there anything you've, you've accomplished quite a bit? I mean, is there anything and you have a, a, a firm grasp on what you want to do in the future? Um, is there anything that you're, you're still kind of unsure about in, in life? Whew. Well, I'm still looking for, for the woman that'll have me, still trying to find the woman that'll have me, so maybe that's... Uh, no, and I actually have a direction for the next five years. I think in five years we can change Africa, and I, I was just about ready to go lay on a beach, sell the retail company, spin things off, and go lay on a beach and, and enjoy life. But I think I've got... I would enjoy it if for the next five years I was laying on a beach thinking, if I just gutted it out for a few more years, I could have changed the world for 2 billion people. So I'm going to do this for five years, and then I'm going to five more years focusing on blockchain and then go lay on a beach. So, Patrick, I got to say, I, um, I mean, you're a great mind. You're very humble, um, and you're contributing a lot. It's hard for me to see you lie on a beach doing nothing. I would think after maybe a month, you'd, you'd get back into something. But I could be wrong, and, and you may have thought this through, and I could be wrong. But uh, I hope to see this, you know, hope to see everything come true in, in five years. And if that's the case, uh, if that's your contribution and then you go to the beach, that would be great as well. Uh, Patrick, thanks so much for coming on Humans of Bitcoin. It was, it was a pleasure to have you on. Matt, it's an honor. Have me back anytime. Anytime you need to fill in, give me a call. <laughs>